Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My guest this evening is Dr. Paul Young. He's here to tell his story of, he was an uh, independent Bible pastor for 30 years? Yes, over 30 years. Okay, over 30 years. He was also involved with an international organization called Community Bible Study. Some of you may be aware of that program, which uh, has uh, groups all over the world. Yes. Uh, and, uh, but he was, he's going to talk about how, again, following Jesus Christ and, uh, captured his attention. Uh, I use the image of something getting hit with a two by four, getting awakened, yes. and uh, drawn to the reality of the theme for tonight we're going to call the reality of too many voices. Uh, the many voices out there all claiming on the one hand to be based on the sole foundation of Scripture, yet so many voices, so many opinions. How can one know which of them is true? Which is the correct interpretation of Scripture? And uh, Paul being one that pastored a very large congregation with therefore uh, a major responsibility on his shoulders as he stood in the pulpit every Sunday, delivering what was true to the people. How does one sift through the many voices? That's what we're going to deal with tonight. On the one hand, a common theme with so many of our uh, guests from week to week, but I think in Paul's case, you'll see that it was particularly uh, crucial because it caused a great change in his life as he sought to follow Jesus. Now, your questions are an important part of this program every week, so if you'd call us with your questions, call one 800 Two two one nine four six zero, or send us an email at journeyhome at ewtn.com. Paul, welcome to the Journey Home. Thank you. It's great to be with you. It is. In fact, I'm glad that uh, you're willing to uh, jump up and take this slot. We had a cancellation, uh, so some of you may have seen a different name listed at one point on the internet. But I appreciate that. In fact, I want to extend a special thanks to your wife Sandy for letting you come. Uh, we need to keep Sandy in our prayers. This Wednesday, she'll yes. be facing surgery for cancer. Yes. And uh, it was a difficult time, but she wanted uh, you to come and yes. share your journey with us. So we thank her for that. So keep her in our prayers. Amen. <laughs> you and I met about, about a year ago, about that long? Well, we had lunch uh, last this past June, but we talked. Yeah, That's it was right. uh, three or four years ago That's on right. the phone. Yes. In fact, I didn't remember your name from that because you were kind of anonymous about that. Oh, yes. I didn't want my name to be used anywhere. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're still using in that st awkward stage yes. of being a pastor, Protestant, but still in the ministry, still yes. very much connected, and uh, knowing that if the information got out. And I Christian, might be in trouble. We might talk about that a little more later because that's one of the reasons the Coming Home Network exists, because when we find out about... I've got enough... I receive emails and letters from many Lutheran, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, and Anglican ministers who watch this program all the time. Hmm. And a lot of times they don't know who to talk to in the midst of their pastorate. Yes. And so we get them linked up with men and women in the Coming Home Network who've been from similar backgrounds hmm. that can address their issues. But I'll tell you what, as we begin every week, I invite you to start with giving us a bit of your spiritual background. Well, Marcus, I came to Christ First of all, I was raised in a godly home. My father was a Baptist pastor, and my mother loved Christ, and my dad was a very creative person. In fact, he even, I think, helped establish one of the first Christian funny books back in the 40s. <laughs> right? And uh, he was a great storyteller. And when I was four years old, uh, it was down in Phoenix, Arizona. I still remember the night he told the story of Noah and the Ark and how there was only one way in to that boat. And, uh, and then he, he wound up saying that the same way with heaven. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. And, and then we wound up praying. And I, I came up to Dad afterwards. The Spirit of God was moving in my heart. And I was crying, and he thought maybe one of my brothers. I had three brothers uh, had hit me, you. yeah, beaten up on me. And, and, and then I, in, in my sobbing, I said, I want to be safe in the ark. I, I want Jesus. And he didn't believe that little kids could accept Christ. <laughs> but anyway, he knelt down with me and showed me the verses that I know you're familiar with, John 3, 16, and all those verses. And, and that night, I trusted Christ as my personal Savior. I still remember it, the joy that flooded my heart. And so I was raised in this context of having this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I think it was eight, eight, eight years old or so that I was finally baptized, again, by my father. And later on, at age 20, my dad married uh, Sandy and me. Uh, and, and so I was raised in this godly atmosphere. I get up as a teenager, and, and my dad always got up early. And my father 
would have a Bible in his lap, and I'd see him spending time with God. And, and so uh, what, what a, 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 an image. Yeah. Oh, what an image. Yeah, to have a dad. And, and you know, I'm, I, in a lot of ways, I'm like my dad because <laughs> I wanted to be like him, and I wanted to love God like he did. And uh, so th this is how I was raised. And ultimately went to seminary and called to ministry, and, and uh, Sandy and I have had uh, some awesome years, 30-some years in uh, pastoral ministry, and then uh, in mission work overseas, and have seen literally tens of thousands. Now, this is a Protestant way to put it, but you know, when you have, when you see over a hundred thousand decisions for Christ, it's awesome, yeah, yeah. and uh, and to see churches grow and flourish, and, and so in in some ways, there's no reason why I should ever think about becoming a Catholic. <laughs> That's you had everything good yeah. going for you in the sense of of effective ministry and opportunities for service. It was exciting, service. yes, and, and including. Now, were you working for the? community Bible studies concurrently as a pastor? Or? Well, I was pastor for a number of years, and then, then uh, when the walls came down overseas, I went into Bulgaria, did some work with, you're probably familiar with Campus Crusade for Christ, and uh, yeah. the Jesus film, and uh, uh, Louis Palau, and yeah. then, then, then ultimately moved for seven years with uh, heading up uh, CBS International, wonderful organization, and uh, helping people around the world get into an in-depth study of, of uh, the Holy Scriptures. Okay. Did that involve producing materials or was it just a mother? Well, uh, the, the mother organization produced the materials and yeah. uh, great materials helping people to study at home and spend yeah. some time with God right. in the Scriptures right. every week and then get together in small groups and then there'd be a lecture yeah. and a tremendous fruit from it. Yes, yeah, I remember when you called me a couple years ago. Yeah. I think I think I remember seeing, I had one of those little uh, address things with my phone. And it was, uh, I think it came across, community Bible study or something that came across. Probably there. did, yes. Yeah, and I'm thinking, what is this? Where am I getting a phone call from? Yes. And then you and I talked, and I don't think you told me your first, your name the first time. I was time. anonymous. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> because being in that position yeah. and what you were thinking about. Now, <clears throat> the theme for tonight we chose is too many voices. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, if you, you were uh, an independent Bible Yes, it was. Well, uh, I, 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 I didn't like is. the word independent, but right. it was. It was a, a church that basically had a group of elders that ran the church, and there was no denomination. We just depended upon on, on the Bible, you know, to to help us and guide us, and we, and we taught the Bible. That's why it was called a Bible church, and so uh, the Bible was our authority, and uh, we felt we were under the authority of Jesus Christ, okay. and so doing. So you there you were as an independent yeah. or a Bible church pastor. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> In a town where there was Methodist? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Lots of Methodists. And uh, this was in uh, one of the places was in Fort Worth, Texas, where I, okay. I was okay. for a number of years. Uh, and uh, Episcopal and uh, okay. all, all different kinds so of churches. So how did you understand at that point as a pastor all these different groups, different churches? Uh, well, you know, how did you explain that you to know, your back people to, if back they asked why yeah. are there so many churches? Well, we, we didn't see the church as something that was necessarily concrete. Uh, it was more uh, an invisible association. And so whether you were Episcopal or Methodist or, or uh, Baptist or Bible, whatever, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then you were a part of this universal body. Okay. And, and so uh, all, all those things began to kind of bother me back then. I, I remember uh, I'm a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary, and if anybody uh, on the air is a graduate and wondering what is this guy doing <laughs> turning Catholic, <laughs> uh, a, 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 you know, a traitor to the cause, uh, let me say that Dallas Theological Seminary, I mean, uh, I, I look upon it with uh, tremendous yeah. love and, and affection. Great teachers taught me to love God, love, love the Holy yeah. Scriptures. I almost went there. Because oh, you did? I, yeah. I loved the, the Howard Hendricks. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, well, that's, yeah. I majored in Howard Hendricks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but, uh, but there was a, a person, and, and again, when we use these names, I have fond, a fond affection for these people, like John MacArthur. He wrote a book uh, uh, basically kind of against some professors at Dallas Seminary, uh, mm -hmm. Charles Ryrie and St. Hodges, because they, he, he felt they didn't understand what it meant to become a Christian, how to become a Christian. And so they kind of started writing books against each other, and I began to see some of this uh, disturbance within evangelical Protestantism, and I started asking, why? Uh, it, we don't even know the essentials. I mean, this is essential. I mean, how do you get to heaven? You know, the rich uh, young ruler said, how can I gain eternal life? That's a great question. Now, what's the answer? And if John MacArthur and Charles Ryrie and Zane Hodges and James Boyce and some of these other great men yeah. 
if they agree. if they don't agree then where does that leave me? Yeah, you could throw into that match uh, Gordon Conwell, my seminary, because Gordon Conwell, the way it taught and understood and yeah. interpreted scripture was quite a bit different than Dallas Theological yes, Seminary. Yes, that's mean, right. The complete understanding of, of the ages of salvation, uh, covenant versus dispensation. Oh, yes. Completely and, different understanding. Of and I did not have a very good view of Gordon you Conwell probably Seminary. probably did not. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's an example of what we're talking about. Yes. I mean, two... I mean, if you stand back from the picture, yeah. two evangel groups of evangelical, Bible-believing, Christ-loving men and women, yes. but almost two different universes. Yes. Now, did you see that as a pastor at that point, or was this later as you were drawn? Probably it was later as I okay. moved in uh, to overseas ministry, right. and I began to work with uh, churches. And, um, uh, and, and you go into one place and there's a number of Presbyterians, for example, in South Korea, and they don't get along with each other. Or you go to France, and the average Protestant church is about 35 people, and they don't get along with a Protestant church up the street from them. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're barely hanging on for life. I mean, basically, France is a Catholic country. And, and it began to disturb me, and I began to preach on the whole subject of unity and trying to get these pastors and people to work together, because I know the cry of the heart of Jesus Christ, as he says in John 17, he says, Father, that they might be one. And we weren't one. And it, it bothered me. Why aren't we one today? Yeah, what was the, your initial answer to what needed to be done to establish unity amongst all these? As you're struggling with this, I'm wondering, if you're, as you're a Protestant minister, did you see all digging deeper into Scripture, and of course, then we'd be more one, or well, listening to the Holy Spirit better, or? Of course, the simple answer is that everybody think like I do. <laughs> okay. You know, if everybody see the Bible the way I did, because, and my background, my training, because at Dallas Theological Seminary or wherever you go to school, you tend to think that these men are men of God, and, and they, they spend a lot of time in the Word, and they know the Greek and the Hebrew, and, yeah. and, and they so can therefore. parse all the verbs. And, every, and so, therefore, uh, you know, if they could become like us, and, and of course, we always went to the scriptures and, and always tried to prove our points through scriptures and through comparing scripture with scripture, not trying to take passages out of context. And, and so, uh, uh, but yet on the other side, uh, uh, I knew that the answer and, and the message I brought was a message of love. If we could understand, you know, you know Paul talks about, uh, St. Paul does in Ephesians chapter 3, about uh, unity. And chapter 4 he does. And, and, but there in that passage he talks, he has a tremendous prayer that they would understand the love of Jesus Christ. You know, the height and the breadth and the depth. And, 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 and so my message was that love, matter of fact, this was my, my basic thrust of the message. And I preach this message around the world. Love is the glue that brings the body together. You know, and I was going to say that that's one of those other answers. I mean, you know, everybody does, does the same Bible study yeah. or, or, you know, other answers to what's going to establish unity. And of course, mm -hmm. then one answer is going to be love. Love is the glue. And, and of course, yeah. on the one hand, I couldn't agree more, yeah. Yeah. but what does love leave out? What That's does right. love bring in? Uh, you know, Paul at one time had to kick a guy out of the church because he was doing immorality. Mm -hmm. Well, does love say, no, it doesn't matter. We'll just love you. It doesn't matter what you do. So, I mean, there... Even in that sense, you have different opinions on what love is. Yeah, that's <laughs> right? right. I mean, look at Hollywood. Yeah, oh, you know, yes. In fact, it was interesting. You were, you were talking about the passage in, in Ephesians where it says, there is one body and one spirit, just as we were called in the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. All this ones, you know, all the unity. Yes. And it's interesting that all of this about the apostles, the different gifts called to equip, why? So that hopefully one day they may lo no longer be tossed like little children to and fro carried about by every wind of doctrine. I mean, yes. It's interesting, in the, in the same passage, we have the unity, and yet being tossed well, to and fro by the And doctrine. in that passage, you take one baptism. Well, what baptism is he talking about? And we had a tendency did on our side... Did you re-baptize in your, in your church? Uh, no, we did not re... Well, oh, yes, if, if a Catholic came in. <laughs> <laughs> is that right? Uh, oh, yeah, oh, sure. I mean... Uh, You'd accept an Episcopalian vote on Catholic. Well, probably so. <laughs> uh, and we had, you know, it's, am it's amazing how many Protestant churches have, are made up of 30, 20, 30, 40% yeah. Catholic. Yeah. And, um, and, and, 
but, but that whole thing of one baptism. I mean, what, what are we talking about? Infant baptism? Are we talking about uh, spirit baptism? And, 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 uh, and, 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 and the disagreements is on baptism and the methods of baptism and even what you say. Because some people, though they're Trinitarian, will not say in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They may say, I just baptize you in the name of Jesus. Or I baptize you in his name. Yeah. And that's it. We're hearing now the, what's the new one? The Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. I mean, we're hearing all kinds of good yes. things floating yeah. around. You know. All right. Well, what got your attention to the church? I mean, uh, I know people that ended up where you're talking about mm. and ended up just either cashing out on the ministry completely going off into something else because it drove them batty with all these different confusion. Yes. Or they just put blinders on and said, I'm just going to do my job. But your Lord got you in a different direction. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first thing that grabbed our attention was our oldest son came back from after high school. He was gone for a year doing mission work uh, with Wycliffe. You're familiar with that organization down in South America. And, but got to know some Catholics down there and watched them and watched their love for the people. And uh, came back, went to New York University, and had become an Episcopalian, which was not necessarily a thing that, uh, that, uh, that got our favor. Uh, but walked into a, an Episcopal church, and this is not true. I mean, there are many wonderful Episcopalians, but yeah. walked into a church with a, a, a breasted Christ on the cross. Yeah. And it just turned his stomach and said, I've got to do something. And so found a person, Father Nielsen, uh, that was near the campus. And, and, and then wrote us, uh, wrote us a 186-page letter longhand that he was becoming Catholic. And it just it took me a weekend to read it. It just that blew us away. That certainly bespeaks <laughs> how, how hard he figured the wall was to get yeah. through to get you. Well, he was using the scripture and everything else. But uh, uh, I read it, and, and, I, and a lot of his thinking was good. But I knew he had been deceived. <laughs> and so when he came home that summer from, uh, from university, it was World War III. I mean, he and I went head to head to head. We never got angry at each other, but I'll tell you, well, the rest of the family had to tell us to quit talking about Catholic versus Protestant at the, at the table. And, uh, and he'd often say, you know, because I, I'd, he'd say, well, you know, how do you know the passage says what you're saying? How do you know it means that? And I'd say, well, you know, I just read the context. I mean, it's right here, all you need is a Bible. He said, but, but how do you know what it means? He said, you need to read the early church fathers. I, I don't need the early church fathers. <laughs> I don't give a rip what they say. It's just, what does the Bible say? And so just round and around we went. Uh, and then we went with them a couple times to the Catholic church, and I knew, I knew that he'd been misled. I mean, you walk in, and you see a statue of Mary and you see one of Joseph, and you see the crucifix. I mean, don't the Catholics know that Jesus is alive? <laughs> and the, this is some of our thinking, right, you understand? Right. And then it, was, there, it felt so there. cold and sterile. And, and Sandy and I were raised in a totally non-liturgical background. I, we didn't know what Advent was. We didn't know uh, Lent was something that was in your belly button. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, we had no idea what Lent in 40 days. I, I, we just weren't raised in this atmosphere. I remember going going to the Catholic Church and 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 you know they do something on their forehead and their mouth and I and, and I didn't know if they were scratching themselves or I didn't know what they were doing, and so so it was it was so foreign to us, uh, and then a few years later our youngest son we've got three sons, youngest son became Catholic, and Sandy and I it, we just cried, what have we done wrong? I mean here we were a family that taught the grace of God and here are these. These young men are being seduced by the Catholic Church. The works righteousness Catholic huh? Church. The works righteousness Catholic Church. Oh yes, and we just we, and of course we just didn't understand. Right. And and uh, Tim, our youngest, had invited us to his um, his uh, confirmation, and I wrote him a letter and said, absolutely no way, no way can we agree to what you're doing. And it was the first time I'd. I, I was never really anti-Catholic, but, but that letter I was anti-Catholic. Yeah, I, I, just, sounds like it, I pulled out everything that was kind of anti-Catholic, everything I'd learned in the past, all the problems and difficulties, and just dumped it on him. And uh, it was sad, but I mean, but I was trying to be honest. And, uh, but it wasn't until, um, I would say a few years after that, well, I got a, Scott, a, a, a tape by Scott Hahn, but I remember listening to that tape, and I, of course he was involved in Young Life and right. some things, and, and, I, and, I, and I liked what he had to say, except at the end of his tape, he prayed the rosary 
And I thought, oh my goodness. Uh, and I, <laughs> and it just kind of turned me off. And then I think it was maybe a year later that my youngest son sent us a book by Pat Madrid, the, the book on testimonies, your testimony. Surprised by truth, yes. And, and he said in that letter, he said, I'm praying every day that you and mom would become Catholic. And both Sandy and I turned and looked at each other and said, boy, hell would have to freeze over before we, I mean, his prayers are being wasted. Uh, but at least he's sincere, you know, we're glad for that. And, and so I, I remember I was on a trip to Lima, Peru, and I took that book with me. And as I normally do, I, you know, I read the scriptures every morning and pray. And then I began reading that book, and I was absolutely amazed. Uh, I had never had read anything like it. Never thought that there were any answers. I, I just thought that Catholics, you know, there were some things they had right, but there was a lot of things they had wrong. And I began to read that book and say, wow, there's some answers to these questions. And, um, and then I think it was later on, my oldest son ultimately joined a, a, a monastery and, uh, and then sent me uh, the journal, First Things. And I began to read that, and there was a Lutheran pastor. I don't, I don't know if he's ever converted yet, but he talked about the issue of authority. And it was at that time, it was early one morning, when I read that, it was, there was a little click that went on, and, uh, and, and I knew that I was not under authority. That I always was under this, but I wasn't under the God, the Jesus who uh, ultimately established the church. And, uh, and, and through the church, we got the Holy Scriptures, the New Testament particularly. And, um, and so it was uh, it, when my son came home from the monastery, things it didn't uh, work out. The men were older than he was, and it just didn't, some things didn't work out. I told him that I was interested in doing some reading. And it just it surprised Sandy and surprised, oh, really surprised my oldest son. I, <laughs> and, uh, and so the first book, he said, why don't you read Catholic, uh, Fundamentalism and the Catholic Faith by Carl Keating. Oh, Catholicism and Fundamentalism. Uh, Catholicism and Fundamentalism, yes. Yes, excellent book. And I took that <clears throat> on a trip. I was speaking at a missions conference up in Wisconsin. And I'd, I'd speak, I'd go back to my motel room and start reading, and I'd start crying. <laughs> Marcus, I was, I was yeah. uh, repentant. I was ashamed of myself, in a sense. I, I just, you know, I was ignorant. I just didn't know that, um, that the Catholic Church was the church that Jesus established. And I, I loved Jesus, and I wanted what Jesus wanted. And, and uh, I've always wanted what Jesus wanted for me. And uh, so it was just a whole process of coming back it's from that point you, on. You said that, I mean, I went through so many of those same stages. and. and even Carl Keating's book, and of course Scott Hall and I went to seminary together, and his witness was so powerful, yeah. important in, in this. So I know what it did to you, emotively. I mean, I I know there. We need to maybe explain to the audience, not just emotively, but intellectually. For example, you had made the comment of feeling guilty as a result of re a remorse as a result of reading Carl Keating's book. Talk a bit about that. In in a sense, uh, I mean, you didn't know. Well, I was. I I was judgmental. Yeah. I, I thought the Catholics were hanging on by their, you know, had, had white knuckles, hanging on by their fingers, hoping they'd make it to heaven. Yeah. I didn't understand how grace, the whole uh, the truth of God's grace is so p penetrating through hot Catholic God, yeah, yeah. dogma and doctrine. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole sacramental system that I, you know, it, I was raised, we didn't even have any sacraments. We had two ordinances, you know. And even baptism basically just kind of got you wet. Nothing happened, really. It was just only an outward expression of an inward reality. And, 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 and so I just didn't understand these things. I, I had said things uh, about people praying to Mary, and I, I, I used to make little comments. And uh, so I just had to, had to ask for forgiveness. I mean, I had to get on my knees and just repent from my attitudes that I had toward Catholic and toward my Catholic brothers and sisters. Would you say you were like so many that you, you passed along to your people what you had been taught, but not examined yourself about the church, yeah, all, the church teachings? Yes, everything I read about the Catholics were written by Protestant evangelicals. People you trusted, so they yeah, right. just took it. And, 
Yes. Was a Catholic church. And well, sometimes you'd read something by someone who had been a Catholic, sometimes sure. a Catholic priest. Yeah. yeah. And so, my goodness, if he became a Protestant evangelical yeah. and would tell the inside story, well, uh, you know, you had all you needed. Yeah. Yeah. What now do you look back on that inside story as you now are a Catholic and you've understood as you look back on the on the inside story that some would, who were ex-Catholics, give about the church. Any well, we had we had a lot of Catholics that came into our church, right? And uh, I, I think a lot of times Catholics, you know, uh, they're they, they of course they're baptized as babies, they're catechized, <laughs> yeah. confirmed, uh, but then after that, I've talked to many Catholics and as adults, they've just never gone through an educational, a formation program. Sure. And so uh, when they get next to a, a, a Protestant evangelical who has, who's been, as, as the term we use, who's been discipled, mm -hmm. will begin to quote scripture and, and basically say, well, Marcus, have you been born again? Well, you, you know, if you don't know the term from John 3, you may say, well, no, I don't think I have. Or have you ever received Jesus Christ, your personal Lord and Savior? Well, I don't think I have. And see, Catholics do that every week when they receive the Eucharist. That's right. They receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. <laughs> you talk about an altar oh, call. Oh, I mean, yeah. Coming in to receive the sacrament. Oh, and what a privilege because uh, we receive in a, in a way, it's not just spiritual. We receive Him, the, even the, 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 the body, blood, soul, and divinity, everything that He is. Um, well, for, I remember you were, we were talking earlier and you made the, the comment that really, in a sense, uh, when you understood the authority of the church that Christ gave the apostles, and, and called them, you know, gave them the Holy Spirit to lead them in the truth. That once you understood the, the authority, a, a lot of things fell into place that uh, took a while to understand. Yes. Right. But at least you could trust the, the source they were coming from. For you, what was the most difficult part of the journey coming in? I mean, you were a Protestant for how many years before you became Catholic? Oh, my. I, well, I was, I was 58 years old, yeah. raised, steeped, and, and, and good. I mean, this is not... You know, there's some Protestantism that is not as good, yeah. but this is robust and passionate, uh, in love with Jesus. I used to tell my young son, he said, well, why don't you try the Catholic Church? I said, listen, if I could see some passion there. I mean, where I go, there's passion. <laughs> and, and, but I just didn't understand. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, I, uh, but what was difficult? Yeah, what was difficult, right. Uh, I would say... There were a lot of things, <laughs> but the hardest thing was just going to the Catholic Church. Just the culture. The liturgy, it. the culture. You know, when, when the last church, Protestant church we went to, had a 45-piece orchestra. They had a big choir. When you have great preaching, I mean, you get goosebumps on your goosebumps. <laughs> uh, and then you go to the Catholic, the parish church, yeah. and you kind of sit there, and they've got a little choir, and Half the people don't sing as well, and yeah. and uh, there's no orchestra. There's no, and maybe the homily doesn't have the same ring, and and you don't know when to stand and when to sit down, and you're just that's the hardest part. Yeah, right you're there. just uncomfortable. <laughs> and sometimes when you feel uncomfortable, you think it's wrong. Yeah. And and so I didn't know when to cross myself. I didn't know when to kneel and stand up. And then I had to sit during the Eucharist, <laughs> and I didn't like that. I mean, listen, I'm, I'm a member of the body of Christ. Why can't I go up there and receive that? And, and, and so you feel like, you, like uh, you're, you're a beggar. Uh, and, and so that, that was hard for Sandy and, and for me. Which is, in some sense, a good step of humiliation, if you want to say it, or suffering, you know, to understand. I remember we went through it too, and it took us a while to understand um, <clears throat> what is behind the statues, what's behind the rites, yes. what's behind the things that we're doing. And so sadly sometimes when we see in certain sides of Catholicism wanting to get away with this stuff, maybe they justify it because it does seem to stand in the way of people, so let's get rid of, get rid of the distractions. Yeah. I hate to see that happening rather than helping people understand yes. the significance so that they can use them correctly and then as they make the transition into the church can appreciate them in the process. Well and then once you understand the Eucharist, the Mass and what's going on, yeah. how can you go anywhere else? Uh -huh. uh, it doesn't matter whether the homily is good or not. I mean it does matter. I like a good homily. Uh -huh. We go to a great parish uh, 
uh, Father Kevin McCarthy. I'll tell you, and we have a tremendous community there in Valparaiso, Indiana. But, uh, and so, I mean, it's alive and dynamic. But, but even if it wasn't, yeah. Jesus is still there. There's a miracle that happens on the altar every Mass. Yeah. And we get to eat of Him. People say, well, you know, I go to a Protestant evangelical church because I don't get fed at the Catholic Church. Well, we get fed. We do get fed. We get <laughs> fed. How can you get more than Jesus? <laughs> And uh, so once you understand that, but you know, you can understand it up here. It takes a while to begin to yeah. get in, not just into your heart. You can yeah. even understand your heart, but into the emotional fabric. Well, especially for someone coming from your background. I, mean, yeah. I know some that come from a high church, Episcopalian, oh, Lutheran. Yeah. It's, it's not quite the change, but so many of the clergy converts I've met who've come from either independent or Bible or yeah. more fundamentalist or charismatic. Yes. It's, it's, it's sometimes a, a big jump. We're going to take a break right now, though. Thanks a lot, Paul, for, Thank you. for giving us a good introduction. We'll take a break, and then we'll come back with your questions for Dr. Paul Young about his journey of faith and maybe the issue of too many voices. Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guest this evening, Dr. Paul Young, has been talking with us about his journey. And, uh, you know, you were 58 when you came into the church. Yes. And I know the struggle that with <clears throat> so many clergy that I've worked with, that that's a difficult time to make a decision that's such a disruption in a career. Oh, my. In a vocation. You know, eight years old. You're, you know, a lot of guys think of retiring at 65. Of course, when you know when you're in ministry, you, you never want right. to retire. But, but yes, and so, uh, <laughs> and then uh, all of me, I wound up losing my responsibility. And yeah. and uh, some people think that when you become a Catholic, you write a book and get rich. Uh, not in my case. <laughs> <laughs> Nor in mine. My wife and I have been on a starvation no. diet the last last year. Yes. <laughs> Let's. Uh, I know, and that really is an important fact. I asked the audience who are regular watchers of The Journey Home and supporters of The Coming Home Network, as well as all the work of EWTN, uh, keep converts and those on the journey in your prayers. Because often, especially for clergy converts, when you're facing this decision, it's, it's not merely, well, I'm, I love Jesus, I'll go to this church this weekend. I mean, it's a bigger issue. It's, it's vocation, it's family. Sometimes it's issues of marriage. It's a I lot was thinking, of issues. Yes, I was reading one of your letters one time, and. And uh, I think it was a, a Catholic convert or a, a clergy convert in, uh, I, I think it was Fort Worth, Texas, who is working, welcoming people into Walmart. Yeah. And so, you know, they get paid six, seven, eight bucks an hour. And so, you know, the family has to be struggling. Yeah, this, yes. Uh, I mean, what was, what was so bad about that was not that there's anything wrong with working at Walmart. That was not the issue. Oh, no. The not worst at all. is that he'd been a pastor for 30 years, all of that training, experience, oh, yes. the gifts. The, his counseling, all of that he had done, and then when he comes into the church, that's what he, all he could find it. That's to right. Do. Yes. So we need to pray that doors would open for their yes. gifts, uh, but also that they would have a support around them as they make difficult decisions. Let's take this first email. It comes from Andy in West Virginia. Dear Marcus and Dr. Young, I've met a number of independent, non denominational Protestants who tell me that the Catholic Church is the church that has too many voices. They basically say, Mary, the saints, the Pope, etc., makes salvation much too complicated, distracting, confusing. That is all much simpler than the Catholic Church makes it. What do you think of this? Is this what you found? Uh, how did and do you address this issue of simplicity? I mean, we all, have the Quakers. Yeah. I mean, they basically throw you know almost everything out and just, yeah. you just sit and sit wait in a circle and, and yes, wait for yeah. the Spirit to speak. Yeah. Uh, but I, 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 it's a very good question. But I, 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 I find that Catholic Church. Uh, Mary, the saints, the Pope, or our Papa, our Father, uh, there's a unifying factor. They have the same message. Whereas within evangelical Protestantism or uh, Protestantism at large, many different messages, even on how to become a Christian, or how the end times questions, you know, when is Jesus coming? 
or uh, many other many other you things speak that in tongues or not? Yes. Yeah, oh yeah. Slain in the oh, I was I was in it worked in Eastern Europe, and you had to speak in tongues to become a Christian. Yeah. Uh, then others say, Oh no, absolutely not. And so and so you talk about the the variety of voices, uh, uh, the distraction. Oh, and many uh, uh, of them out there within the uh, Protestant world. And they also the, the question is this issue of simplicity. And I do remember, you know, there was the four spiritual laws. Yes. Some had a five spiritual laws. Yeah. Then there was the Roman road. So, yes. I mean, which one do you take? But, I mean, so on the one hand, it sounds real simple, these four or five steps. To, it sounds very simple. But in reality, at the core of the Catholic understanding of salvation is I have become a child of God. Yes. That's salvation. I am a child in the family. That's what salvation is. Now I'm to live like a child. Yes. I'm to be obedient to my father. And he gives me the grace to be able to. And when I fall, I have brothers called priests that are there to help me. I mean, it's a family. It is. The simplicity yes. of the Catholic gospel is a family. Everything fits in the family. We have a photo, a whole photo book of our family called the saints. Yes. All the I brothers like have gone to help us. I mean, it's not distractions. They all draw us to Jesus. I never could understand that until I became a Catholic, the the uh, communion of saints. Yeah. Because I, you know, the people that I talked to were here on this earth, but the the people who'd gone beyond, you know, they were just kind of yeah. forgotten. Yeah. But now that we're all working together uh, to see the purposes of Christ fulfilled, bring about the well, fulfillment. As you said of the earlier, kingdom. I mean, such a, uh, an expression of grace in the church. Oh yes. That's, the communion of saints points to grace. Yes. And what God has been able to do in these wonderful men and women throughout the centuries. Mm -hmm. Let's take our first caller this evening. Hello, Jane from North Carolina. What's your question for us? I have a question for Dr. Young. You talk about having been a missionary overseas and seeing thousands of decisions for Christ. Were these in Catholic countries? And if so, how do you feel about that now? And as a follow-on question, what do you suggest we say to Protestant friends who are making a talk about talking about making a missionary trip to a Catholic country. Thank you, and I love the show. Thank you very much for your question too. All right, how do you very, feel about that? Very good <laughs> question, and uh, I mean, I just wondered, are you asking me to repent? <laughs> uh, but you know, as an evangelical at the time, I you know, anytime we bring people to Christ, and I, I would say it would be the heartbeat of this show whether Catholic or Protestant, because the church is really quite large. All those who are baptized into Christ. Yeah. And so anytime people are brought to Christ, that's good. Now, it wasn't the best. And so... Uh, Not the fullness. It we wasn't want, the fullness, We yes. want the fullness. But and in some of these countries, for example, Bulgaria, <laughs> where we saw, uh, uh, I, I think it was close to 80,000 uh, people uh, make a decision for Christ, the use of the yeah. Jesus film. Over 90 churches planted. It was exciting, and I know what will happen with those people. There's some good things that will happen. Yeah. And maybe one of these days, as people follow Christ, they'll do what the Holy Spirit has done with me, even open up their eyes to a more fuller expression of the, of the truth. There's a, there's a very challenging statement in Vatican II in the, the document on ecumenism that I find very challenging to us as Catholics. It says, it's in the fourth paragraph in that document, the fourth section, it says that whatever the Holy Spirit has engraced in the hearts of our separated brethren is for our spiritual renewal. Hmm. And it's a very That's powerful good. state for us Catholics to listen to because there are some times when we recognize that the Holy Spirit has worked out there in ways that maybe because of our stubbornness hasn't been able to work in here, right? And so what can we learn? Yes. It doesn't mean that we, we uh, listen to everything that's happening out there because it isn't always either the fullness or even correct, like you talk about all the confusion between the different voices. But sometimes, I mean, why is it? What's, what's happened when 80,000 Catholics, I don't know if they were all Catholics. No, they were probably Orthodox okay. in Bulgaria, okay. yes. Well, what's wrong? And not necessarily what they were doing was wrong, but uh, what can we be doing better mm -hmm. to bring about the, the conversion of our own people to Christ the danger I've always seen, it's true not only in the Catholic Church, but in any Christian tradition where the education and the catechesis becomes institutionalized, where we, we end up putting together a conveyor belt. You know, we baptize them here, we have these classes, yes. 
we have a rite of passage, and then they move on. The danger is always that we can presume that it'll take care of itself. Yes. We put our children in one end, but come out the other end faithful. And if you look at Lutheranism, Presbyterianism, Episcopalianism, Methodism, as well as Catholicism, you can see that the danger is that we can presume as parents that the system will take care of itself and that our children will come out the other end good faithful folk. It isn't always the case. Yeah. So we need to listen to St. Augustine and uh, Thomas Aquinas and others that remind us that we, we need conversions, that young people need to, that's what con confirmation is all about. And for me, the sad thing about the conversions is that it happened out there somewhere. Should have been happening in our own church. And our, our pastor there at St. Teresa, where I go, talks about the fact that uh, he was baptized as an infant, catechized, his mother made him go to confirmation. But he said it wasn't until he was in university that he realized that he needed Jesus Christ as his yeah. own personal Lord and Savior. See, I've mentioned this before, and this is very key, is yes. that the Catholic spiritual writers tell us that we are to have multiple conversions in our spiritual journey. Yes. The first conversion is when we are born again. And when is that? When we're Bapt baptized. Yes. We're that's, that's when we're born again. But it doesn't stop there. We need to have an adult conversion. In fact, the spiritual writer calls it the three ways of the spiritual life. You, you, you grow in more intimacy with the Lord. Yes. We are called to do that. And one of the greatest spiritual writers, called, his name was Gergou Lagrange, said, it is sad when the majority of Christians, laity, priests, religious, and popes, never make it to the second conversion. That is sad. That says something. Yes. Because we presume we've arrived. Yes. We should never arrive. We must always ask, uh, you know, can I go closer to you, Jesus? Through prayer, through scripture reading, um, through the sacraments. I mean, uh, I'm talking too much. I mean, it's a, it's a, excuse well, me. Well, it's a the, journey. It's a, this is important It's issue. a journey, sure. Important. Even, as, even as this program is called a journey, the Christian life yeah. is a journey where we, we don't arrive until we all of we get there. Yeah. Yeah, we're continually growing closer to Christ. Must never take it for granted. Let's take our next email, Chris from Dayton, Ohio. Dear Dr. Young, thank you for sharing the story of your journey. For many Protestants, the subject of Mary is one of the causes of the most difficulty. How did you deal with Catholic teachings on and devotion to the Blessed Mother? Well, I had, you know, before I became Catholic, I had a lot of problems. I recall one time going with our oldest son to the various missions around San Antonio. And, and, and most of those missions, you walk in, and I'd point out to my son, who's the prominent person in front? It's Mary. And Jesus, you know, was held. He was small, but Mary was big. <laughs> and, and I just didn't understand. I, I, you, you don't know, understand. It, it yeah, I just different. didn't. It looked like to me the emphasis was on Mary. And I'm, and I'm not saying that some Catholics may not overemphasize Mary. But uh, as I began to read, and as I began to understand what it meant, Mary, full of grace, yeah. full of grace. And that, I think that, that Greek word is the only time used. Yeah. And, and what it means to be absolutely full. I mean, we just, this past Saturday, we celebrated the Immaculate Conception. Right. And that's not the virgin birth, that's the Immaculate Conception, where Mary was preserved from yeah. original sin. And, and, uh, and, and, and yes, and, and people, people say, well, where's that taught in the Bible? What, uh, that, <laughs> even that word, what a hint, strong hint, you know, uh, full of grace. Of grace. And it's just a way not to uh, focus on Mary, but uh, the early church. And, and this, this truth came right after uh, the church decided who Jesus was in the 300s. You know, all, maybe they got the Nicene Creed and all that. Uh, the the uh, all the problems of uh, whether he's God and man and working through all that. Yeah. Ultimately, then they had to talk about, now, who is Mary? And they resolved that early on in the life of the church. Right. And so as I begin to study that and see again that uh, if I was going to be true uh, to the Lord Jesus, I had to uh, follow the church's teaching because Jesus promised the apostles and the apostolic community, which would be the bishops, that he would guide them into all truth. And I had to accept, and it wasn't hard for me to accept, uh, my yeah. mother. Yeah. Uh, and you know, as I, I paid attention to the mother of Jesus, I think Jesus is honored. Even if you were, uh, Marcus, pay attention to my mother. She's 84 years old and a wonderful, godly woman. And if you pay her attention, 
<laughs> then uh, I'm going to like you better. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to respond to you more. I always liked Scott's argument, which was, you know, if, if we were called to honor our mother and father. Yes. Well, Jesus would do that perfectly, of course. Yes. So he would honor his mother perfectly. And we're called to imitate Jesus. Yes. So, of course, we would do that. We would honor her. Yes. I mean, it's just... There's an email here. I, I, I smile because I'm ready to go to this one. This is a great Good. email. Comes Good. from someone named Chris. Dear Marcus and Paul. Paul, I'm stunned and overjoyed to see you on the journey home. <laughs> I've been in leadership of community Bible study for over 14 years. Huh. CBS's wonderful studies confirmed my Catholicism. Hmm. While I was having to conform to the rules of not talking about my denomination, yes. quote, do you know of any Catholic equivalent to CBS in the meatiness of the Bible studies? God bless you in prayers for Sandy, Chris. Hey, congratulations, and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure maybe we have met. I'm not, I'm not sure, but uh, this is great. Uh, you know, there's a group that uh, you can go on uh, online. I think it's uh, e3mil.com. E it might I, I be think called I'd, Catholic Exchange now. Or it either, could be, e, yeah. either one, you can get to it. And <clears throat> Jeff you, Cavins is involved yes, with it. Right. Jeff Cavins and Scott Hahn, and, right. and uh, they've got some Bible studies. If you look the one, I think they're, they're finishing up one on Revelation, mm -hmm. and it's got the questions. It's got uh, uh, all the background material. Great stuff. They've got one on Romans, uh, yeah. Ephesians, Galatians, Matthew. Uh, and, and so this, this is some great material that is uh, being produced by these men. Uh, great. Uh, all right. In uh, in summary, yes. How has becoming a Catholic has becoming a Catholic drawn you closer to your Lord Jesus? Well, Marcus, all my life, I you know I just wanted to walk with Jesus. I was in uh, and I am in love with Jesus Christ. It was about around 13 years ago that I learned what it meant to begin to listen to Him more. John 10, my sheep hear my voice. It was uh, Solomon that um, uh, and the request you know what can I give you what do you want he says give me Shema give me a hearing heart and so I wanted to have ears on my heart to listen to God better so I could walk with him so I could walk a life of godly wisdom and, I, and I've been making progress in that area but you know one thing that I was a failure at Jesus said to the apostles and to that apostolic community the bishops uh, if you listen to them, you'll listen to me. You know, those who listen to you, listen to me. Now, for me, so that I can listen to God, to Christ even more fully, I can read what the apostolic com community has taught, the magisterium, the, the uh, catechism, the encyclicals of the popes. Great yeah. insight. And, and, I, and, and I'm great hearing. Bible studies too, especially oh, John oh, yeah. Paul's. Yeah, and, and I'm listening. I'm, I'm really hearing more from Jesus, yeah. uh, and uh, and I'm getting further insight, further wisdom. You know, there's a depth in the Catholic Church that I would have never imagined. Yeah. And it is, and frankly, I'm just <laughs> Marcus. I'm just scratching the surface. It is. It is, uh, I, I'm sitting here like a little kid. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I wish I was starting all over again. Maybe God let me live another 100 years. <laughs> you know, that really is a uh, common uh, feeling, uh, that feeling of, you almost have to, it's one of the first things you find is how dumb you are, you know, yeah, when you oh make the my. journey, you know, how, thought, how smart we thought we were, and then, yes. oh boy, there's so much that I didn't know or misunderstood. Yeah. And, then, and then when you discover the fullness of the church, I mean, we still look around the church and we see so much that, it isn't perfect, you know. There's people like you and me in it, right? There's, there's, yes. you know, here we are, and people who aren't as obedient to the teachings and and don't know Christ as much as they should, and mm. take the time, and they're busy. We know that, but 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 the but, but the church is is a wonderful thing, and yes. I, I couldn't agree more. And of yes. course, that's why we do the journey home, is we want people to discover. There was a time the of that. early on when I got out of seminary, went to a church, had a horrible split. There were two men fighting on the front steps. Fighting. Fighting with their fists. Two different sides. And I remember walking away and I told the Lord Jesus, this was back in 1969. There was a lot of revolution on the campus, even within the church. And I remember telling the Lord, Lord, I love you, but I hate the church. I'm now, when you said the church then, you meant... Oh, the church that I was going? Yeah, yeah the yeah. church that I knew. Yeah. But now I can say, Lord Jesus, I love you and I love your church. Yeah. <laughs> Which you called his body. 
I mean, yes. there is the significance that, yeah. John, that Paul recognized that the church is his body. The, the yes. sad idea of, oh, I need Jesus and me, I don't need a church. No, then that's going yes. against scripture and the teaching of the church. That's right. That's right. Well, Paul, thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank you, Marcus. It's a great privilege to have you here. And again, we offer our prayers for Sandy. And thank you for letting you come. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for what you do uh, for you so many of us. Well, thank you very much. We're going to take a break. Back just a moment for some final words for the journey home. Welcome back. Uh, Dr. Paul Young was speaking about the, the too many voices that he encountered as a minister. Here he was, an independent Bible pastor, committed to the Word, love for Jesus, um, but recognizing that, yeah, there's all these churches in all these other corners, and then he goes overseas and sees the different missions. All of them based on a love for Scripture and love for Jesus, but all saying different things. It reminds me of a story very important story in the book of Acts chapter 8 when there's an Ethiopian who it says is a minister of the queen of the Ethiopians <clears throat> was one day sitting in a chariot and Philip, an angel brought Philip to him and, and Philip noticed that, that the, uh, the Ethiopian was sitting in the chariot and he was reading from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah is one of the books we're reading right now during Advent. We're re hearing it all the time, this, the, the, the message of Isaiah. And Philip asks the Ethiopian, do you understand what you are reading? And the Ethiopian says, how can I unless someone guide me? And then the rest of the story goes on. But he points out a very important issue, and that is the reading of the uh, prophet Isaiah, just the reading of the word was not sufficient enough without someone to explain what it meant. There needed to be a teacher. So if you're going to choose a teacher, which authoritative teacher are you going to choose? We're talking about prophecy here. And you know that there are many people with different interpretations of how to understand Daniel and Ezekiel and, and Isaiah and how it referred to Christ. He went to an apostle. And that's what we're called to do. Jesus chose the apostles, gave them the Spirit, promised that the Spirit would lead them into all truth, and that they were then given the command to go forth and make disciples. That's the church. We can trust the church to guide us so that we're following the right Jesus, the true Jesus, the one that died and rose for our, our salvation. Let's give our lives to him. God bless. I'll see you next week.